To whom does a poem speak? Do poems really communicate with those they address? Is reading poems like overhearing? Like performing a script? In this book, I pursue these questions by reading closely a selection of poems that say you to a human being, and by trying to describe the reading process as it encounters these instances of address. In the diverse poems I discuss here, poems not just addressing different categories of fictive and real persons, but written in several different eras and languages, the address itself always becomes an axis of the poem's concern. The poem persistently revolves around or thinks about the contact that is, or is not, being made with the person to whom it is speaking. That was Dr Paul Monk, reading the opening lines from Poetry's Touch on Lyric Address by William Waters, an Associate Professor of German at Boston University. Today I'm speaking with Paul about this question of Lyric Address as it occurs in some of his own poetry, as well as how Professor Waters passes the matter of Lyric Address in his book, originally published in 2003. We're on Bloom, a conversations podcast about anything and everything, featuring interviews with people who've led interesting and flourishing lives. Paul, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be back. Um, these are very enjoyable uh, experiences, these podcasts. So, Paul, perhaps you could start off with telling us a bit about how reading this book by William Waters affected your own approach to lyric address in your poetry. In your forthcoming book, Lyrical Epigrams, your preface echoes Waters, does it not? Right from the opening sentence. Yes, it does. Uh, As we discussed in our conversation about living a poetic life, finding a way to address somebody in a poem, especially an intimate one, is something I've wrestled with for decades. By the time I read Poetry's Touch in early 2004, I'd written love poems to a number of women over about 20 years, but I always felt dissatisfied with how I'd addressed them in part because the poems were written in varying contexts to women with whom I did not have a settled relationship. It's pure coincidence that actually I read the book in the early months of 2004, which was shortly before Claudia Alvarez arrived in Australia, and uh, she would turn out to become my partner in life, my my greatest muse, the love of my life. And I've written most of my poetry for her. So everything else could be seen as a kind of um, dress rehearsal rack. (laughs) Um, And Lyrical Epigrams is a book addressed to her. Many of the poems are explicitly addressed to her, though she's not named in them. Um, And I found myself, when I wrote the preface to that book, thinking very much about William Waters and his book. And uh, the preface uh, reflects that in, in detail. Uh, In fact, it's worth sharing the opening paragraphs of of that book because it will convey to your listeners the way in which I've picked up Waters' concerns and you might say made them my own. The preface begins, This book is addressed to you. It's addressed to you in the sense that it's an offering. Wasn't it the traumatised Paul Celan who wrote that a poem is an offering to someone, an addressable you perhaps, at any rate an addressable reality? And merely by being written and put out into the world, doesn't a poem, to say nothing of a book of poems, address itself to those who come upon it, however they do so, in the vocative? Isn't a reader of necessity in the second person stance as the recipient of a poem? So each of these poems, whomever it appears to address on the surface, is addressed to you. But the book is addressed to you because it is my response as a language animal, as a man of letters, as a reader, to being in the world. It's my outcry as well as my song. Do we cry out to no one? Do we sing into a void? George Steiner speculated in Real Presences that the mere fact of language requires the assumption of an addressable you to whom speech acts are directed, to whom in particular open-ended speech acts and works of creative diction are directed. But open-ended is the keynote. Such speech acts of the kind within this book are not merely declaratory. They are expressive and seek reception and interpretation. In that sense, and for that reason, this book is addressed to you. But it is addressed to you most particularly, as poem after poem will make clear, because you have called forth the expressive in me. These poems constitute not an inward-turned monologue, even if at times, some at least, might be construed as a writer addressing himself, looking back, delving within, casting around. 
but a dialogue with you, with you who urged me years and years ago to put aside the inward-turned sense of inhibition about such expressive writing and to see myself precisely as a writer and a poet. That, very much, is the you to whom this book is addressed and dedicated. That's a wonderful opening few paragraphs to your preface, which speaks to that notion we've discussed in previous podcast episodes of us being language animals, and that outcry or vocative address or song seeking some kind of communicative intimacy and understanding between beings in human relations. How do you draw this addressable you into the body of verse? Where does that start, given that the first poem in it, at least in the current draft form, is based on a famous passage from the Odyssey and evokes Penelope and Odysseus? Well, I might say that that opening poem um, is about dialogue. It's about Penelope knowing that a stranger has come into the house and she wants to sit the stranger down and talk to that stranger and listen to that stranger about his voyages in the hope that he'll know something about Odysseus and can tell her about him. What she doesn't know, of course, is that it is Odysseus. Um, And so that poem sets the scene for what the whole book is about, but it is itself about I and thou, about you, about dialogue. Um, That said, the first poem that directly um, raises this question of the relationship between myself as the poet and uh, and Claudia is the third poem in the book, which is called Before They Cleaned You Up. And uh, Klaus is introduced in this poem in the moment of being born, um, when I was already 12 years old and already reading darkly serious political biography, <laughs> a subject I think we've also discussed elsewhere. Mm. Um, and uh, so the poem, which I'll now read, is me reflecting, looking back all those years, on the uncanny significance that as I was reading about the great terror in Stalin's Russia, she was being born into this world, oblivious to any dark realities. Just weeks before you emerged, in the usual helpless manner, before they cleaned you of blood and fluid, and cut your umbilical cord and placed you at your mother's breast, I was taking summer holidays and reading of the great terror and the killing of countless thousands, tens, hundreds, in the name of revolution, fascinated by the great purge trials the Georgian monster concocted, framing up his Trotskyite clique of traitors and conspirators that riddled the rattled party and its organs, peering, leering, squinting from behind his judicious curtain, as the broken fools confessed and the craven judges shouted again and again as if it set free some avenging god from the, let's say, the dark side of the force. Shoot the mad dogs! That was my summer holiday. My initiation at twelve into, shall we say, reality, starkness, only weeks before you sucked the milk of life in innocence and opened your little eyes to gaze upon unhappiness and love in preparation for our meeting. So the poem declares that at the point where Claudia was actually being born, I was twelve years old and was already reading about Stalin and the Great Terror things that would set me up for a life of serious and even agonized preoccupation with the awful things that human beings do to one another and the enigma of the human presence in the biosphere. The chairs a newborn infant was oblivious to all of that, and, Mm. and it would be, of course, many years before we met. So you lay out quite a bit of your early reading, not only in this first lyric addressed to her, but in many poems in the book. How do these address Claudia? Well, they do so by evoking three things, how my own life of reading now appears to me looking back. Um, in the light of my intimacy with her and her own love of learning and reading. So it's important to remember that that Klaus is a passionate reader and a highly intelligent person. Of course, that's foundational to our dialogue and our love for Mm. one another. Um, But also the poems reflect in many cases on how she stepped into my life, life and became so intimate a part of it and how I now see her in terms of much of my reading from Tolkien to Virginia Woolf. It's reflected in various poems. So with regard to the first of these considerations, uh, uh, or more generally this whole question of a shared life of reading, there's a poem quite early in a book called The Taste for Books, which uh, is an attempt to give expression to this, and it goes like this. You and I succumbed from early childhood to the affliction that the droll Virginia Woolf so mordantly suggests must have infected the colourful Orlando in his cradle, wafted out of Greece and Italy in the floating spoor of Ashfordale, the bane of knightly vigour and ambition, of pedigree and masterful volition, 
enfeebling hand and eye and noble tongue, sapping vital instincts in the young. The love of literature is a disease, slyly quoth that wolf in writer's clothing, which of its fatal nature substitutes a phantom for reality, such that the likes of the young baronet Orlando lose any sense of their inheritance, and so neglect their pleasures and their duties, besotted by the squiggles on the page, that the lordship and the fortune they have been gifted dissolve among their books into a mist. Yet it has been quite otherwise with us, who, lacking lordship of Orlando's kind, and granted strong immunities from birth to those conceits that addle noble brains, absorbed into our blood the potent spore, and turned the fateful germ of Ashfordel, which so depletes the force of feudal houses, into the stuff of our transcendent dreams of well-informed and boldly free opinions, a greater wealth than manners or dominions. Uh, but as an example of the reading of her back into even my own childhood reading, uh, that formed my sensibility. Uh, there's another poem, a, um, a really romantic one actually, which harks back to my love of uh, of the Lord of the Rings uh, as a child, and uh, it reflects on one of the most famous stories in Tolkien about Beren and Luthien, the the man, you know, the hero and the elven princess. And long before I ever met Claudia, that you know that myth, that tale had woven itself into my imagination. And in the poem that follows, uh, what I'm doing is recalling that and how it shaped my romantic imagination and positioned me, in a sense, to uh, want somebody, to need somebody in my life. Um, and she became that somebody in a very important sense. The poem's actually called Enchanted by Tenuviel, Tenuviel being the elven name of Luthien, uh, Luthien of Doriath, the elven princess. And it goes as follows. A Tolkien poem that nothing mars, lit beauty for me under stars. It brought before my dreamy eyes, canopied by Doriath's skies, the figure of Tinuviel. Quite as struck as Beren I was, though far more haplessly, because I could not be there at the green, where music from a pipe unseen enchanted fair Tinuviel. I saw her dancing in the glade, but he it was who swiftly made a hero's bid to win her heart, while I, alas, could play no part in wooing sweet Tenuviel. He called her by her elvish name. She halted, spellbound, and he came and took the princess in his arms, enraptured by the matchless charms of Gondolin's Tenuviel. Ah, long ago they went their way, through fearsome dark to fabled day, to Morgoth's and to Mandos halls, an epic quest that still enthralls my memory of Tenuviel. But I was left in waste and wood, to find another if I could, with whom to plunder Morgoth's crown and face life's mortal furies down, my very own Tenuvia. Hmm, beautiful. So did Claudia become Tenuvia for you then? Yes, I mean, she did in this important sense, which is that in the tale, Beren and Luthien Tenuvia uh, go on extraordinary adventures together. They become partners in dangerous adventures uh, in the wide world. And... Um, uh, Claudia and I have, in her own way, done that. And in particular, and this conversation with her took place before that poem was written, we were in Caracas, where she lives and works, and which is very dangerous, so the country is in all sorts of difficulties, and she is committed to taking on those challenges politically in the country. And she said to me, um, using the nickname that she gave me very early in our, our, our relationship, uh, where she's called me Frodo Baggins, another tag from The Lord of the Rings. She said, Frodo, we have to think big. Um, and if if we had rehearsed this and we set it up for me to write the poem, then she might have said, I'm Luthien and you're Baron and we have to think big. <laughs> but that's the that's the mood of the poem, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But lest people think that, uh, you know, that I construe my relationship with Claudia only in terms of a, a fairy tale, it's worth sharing another poem which was written based on uh, a very real episode in which effectively she proposed to me. You know, it's customary in the old culture for the man to propose to the woman, but she and I were out walking one day. We hadn't yet been married. And she turned to me and she said, there's something I have to say to you, and that is that I'm Arma Mala. And I know a genius when I see one. You're going to be doing some really interesting things in the next few years, and I want to be part of it. And as the poem relates, describing that incident, I was astonished that this moved not simply because she'd taken the initiative, 
but because she'd done it in such an imaginative way to liken herself to Arma Mala was just... Who's Arma Mala? Arma Mala. So Arma, um, as, the, as the poem will describe, but it's best to give the background first so the poem makes more sense, Arma Schindler, as she was originally, was known in her youth as the most beautiful girl in Vienna. She was a lovely Viennese beauty and mm. uh, educated and talented um, a musician herself. And she became enchanted by the idea of marrying Gustav Mahler, who was the director of the Vienna Opera and, and a great composer. And she got a man. Um, then their marriage turned out to be challenging because he was actually so absorbed in his music that he wasn't uh, all that romantic to live with for her. Um, they had two daughters, but she became unhappy in the marriage and she ended up going off with other lovers. And uh, Gustav died brokenhearted. And um, so it's a tragic story in the end. And I knew all that story. And I knew that Tom Lehrer, the great satirical songwriter of the 60s, had written a song called Armour in which he satirizes all of this very jauntily. And um, so... I was just uh, fascinated that that Claudia would choose that image, that woman, that history as her pitch. Mm. And rather than say more about my thoughts at the time, it's it's now appropriate to read the poem because it it uh, provides both that background and um, you know a, a poetic uh, summation of my response. The poem is actually called "Our Ringstrasse Moment." The Ringstrasse being the the great boulevard in Vienna, um, where uh, Alma and Gustav would promenade and where she caught his eye, quite deliberately, of course. Um, and so that's folded into the poem as well. But, uh, but the poem reads, That was quite a pitch you put to me. Walking north in sunlight years ago, it's graven still upon my memory in words at once so colourful and bold that even now they win my wonderment. There's something that I have to say to you, and that is this, you suddenly announced, that I am Alma Mahler, and I know a genius when I see one. You are set to do things of which I want to be a part. Or words to that effect, without a stammer, fully formed and confident, as if you'd meditated long upon the thought, as we strolled so freely through that southern spring, our own ringstrasse and surrounding streets. Alma, I almost burst out with a laugh, are you for real? As in Tom Lehrer's song, am I then Mahler, Gropius, or Werfel? or someone else in your sublime begin. Alma, ah, you took my breath away. We've had since then, of course, our replica of Alma's life with Mahler in Vienna. Two girls and many compositions, right? A love that struggled long to find its way, then rose at last above their tragic fate. For you've been less the Alma of Vienna than the muse I'd longed for, more than for a wife. My anima, my soul, the gift of life, who since she would or could not simply stay, has raised me up to dream and fly away. Mm. And like Alma and Gustav, you and Claudia have had a love that has struggled long to find its way. Your romance and love over the last 15 years or so has not been straightforward or conventional. Can you tell us a bit about that, basing the actual story on several of the poems you've written? Yes, there were several reasons why it wasn't conventional or straightforward or simple and why we had to work very hard to figure out how do we make any kind of intimate life because she realized several things in the few years we actually cohabited. One was that she couldn't really make a life in Australia. She was Venezuelan. She was passionately committed to her own country and she felt she needed to go back there to speak her own language, to work for her country's good, uh, to be able to see her family and her girlfriends. And I say girlfriends because it also turned out that Claudia is gay. And now you can imagine uh, the, the automatic reaction of most people to that would be say, oh, well, then how could it be a romance at all? Well, therein lies a central part of the story because what we discovered, certainly what I discovered, and she would avow the same now, is that instead of being uh, a point of departure where we said, well, you know, then it's, it's not a relationship, we have discovered that we are really soulmates. We've grown closer and closer over the intervening years, not further apart, despite the fact that A, she's gay, and B, she lives in Venezuela. Um, but naturally, it's been hard work, and um, the rewards for that work have come in recent years where we just share everything. We, we 
we think about each other all the time. We talk, we share songs, we've traveled all over the world together, we plan together, we talk about our, yeah. our projects. And so what we've got in the end is a very fertile and committed relationship beyond, if I may put it this way, the conventional routines into which uh, what we would regard successful marriages settle, where, where people have children, they pay off a mortgage, and their relationships become very conventional. Yeah, and I suppose it sheds light on new aspects of romance in itself, you know, because it's your love is non-locative, it's not dependent on being the same city or the same continent even, um, but also in terms of sexualities. But the love of the soul, the alma, is there. Yes, I think you've made a very good point in saying the alma, the soul, because as many of your listeners may not realise, the word alma means soul, right, in Spanish, and Claudia is Hispanic, and... Uh, uh, I don't know, to be honest, that she chose the identity of Alma Mala with that subtlety in mind, but she could have done. Um, and um, and it has absolutely been an education in what it means to love another person, to discover that despite those obstacles, mm. we have grown deeper in love and we now are very special and important to one another. Um, but one of the things that, that also, I think, impeded the intimacy from my point of view early on is that just as I said in that poem about reading uh, the life of Stalin when I was 12 years old, it was very much the case by the time I met Claudia that I had a dark view of the world and I was not at all sure that love and intimacy served any particular purpose. Uh, I, I felt that the world is very dark and I was preoccupied with simply trying to understand it and I've given expression to that uh, outlook in quite a number of the poems. And one of them, which is indicative of that as, as much as any, but which addresses her as well very intimately, is called If at Baba Yar. So some of your listeners will be aware that Baba Yar is a location uh, outside Kiev, where in 1941, when the Nazis had invaded the Soviet Union, they took 30,000 Jewish citizens of Kiev and they shot them all into, into pits uh, in, in a ravine called Baba Yar outside Kiev. It's, a, it's a, appalling stuff. A, appalling incident in, in the wider context of the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's a famous, notorious one. And I'd known about it for many years. And I found myself writing a poem called If at Baba Yar, where I import into that appalling situation this sense of, well, what would you do if you're caught up in that with your beloved? Mm. So that's, that's a bit of work. Yeah. Indeed, exactly so. So it goes as follows. When I contemplate the hecatombs of violence done by human beings to one another, going all the way back to our collective invasion of the hominin worlds beyond the Africa of our long genesis, when I contemplate in sharper focus the atrocities of just our scientific century, from the Belgian Congo via the Somme to the Cultural Revolution in Rwanda, my fear and nausea become personal. No abstract principle or religious icon enters the picture. No, it's you. The dread thought of such brutality being visited upon your singular beauty and my being helpless to avert it. If at Baba Yar the Einsatzgruppen gunned down 30,000 helpless Jews into a forest ravine within two days, what is that among the tens of millions? Only fearful empathy stirs one's horror. Such empathy arises like a bloody mist when I imagine us among the 30,000, shepherded out of Kiev by the SS, dread misgivings growing as we're marched into the wall on a fell morning. You I want to shelter with my body. You I'd shelter by any means at all. Your slaughter is the inexpiable crime. Mine the inextinguishable lament, if at Baba Yar I cannot save you. Two things stand out for me there. The first is your analytic and serious interest in human affairs and history. And the second is your capacity for emotional and moving reflections on love and human relations through poetry, instantiated by your profound love for Claudia. It makes a very powerful reading. Mm. And, it, and when I read it, I get emotional. It's, mm. it's extraordinary because yeah. it does bring those two things together. My, my decades-long preoccupation uh, with the, the horror of what mm. has so often happened in history with this extraordinary partnership with Claudia and the knowledge that so often in history and not least in the past hundred years, so many such couples who genuinely love each other have been murdered. It's just appalling what's yeah. happened. Yeah. Uh, and just how excruciating it would be to be in that situation where 
you can more or less you know what's going to happen and you can't do anything about it yeah, and being you know very recently in love myself i i found myself imagining you know me and my beloved in that in that uh, dreadful circumstance and uh, you know it, it it personalizes history it allows you to imagine yourself into past events and situations you know it's a work of historical empathy and imaginative empathy too yes yes yeah. But conversely, you know, I wouldn't want to convey the impression that that I was wholly depressive, um, <laughs> you know, or that I only wrote dark poems about, <laughs> you <Sorry>. know. <laughs> but uh, so th- there's another one which I wrote, and all these, as I may have said earlier, were written in the last few years. These aren't poems that were written over the last 17 years, but all of them since 2016, right? I wrote other poems for Claudia in the past, but, but all the poems in lyrical epigrams are of recent provenance. But one of them, which is much more playful, if you like, and romantic and literary, is called Proust's Way. And uh, even if one hasn't read Proust's you know, vast novel, In Search of Lost Time, I think the poem's fairly self-explanatory. So I'll, I'll simply I'll share the poem because I think that it, it, it speaks for itself. You, my love, and no one else unless perhaps it was Roger Shattuck a year or so before you first arrived, introduced me to the world of Proust. You used to claim to my bewilderment, I'm Odette de Crecy, with a smile. But strange as it now seems, all the while I thought you said Odette de Crazy. You, my love, and no one else, not Shattuck, much less de Botton, must have been therefore the very first to murmur Proustian nothings in my presence. You, however, did become Odette, Hence some poems I wrote you years ago about lost time and feeling I was swan, conversing with Marcel beside the Seine. You were long gone when I actually read the whole six volumes of the masterwork, while ill and all but corked like Proust, dwelling on remembrance of things past. You, if no one else, will understand how passages from each volume now inform the Proustian reworkings of my life, the autopoiesis I'm embarked upon. When, in Swan's way, Proust wrote of floating flowers, or in the pages of Within a Budding Grove, compared bewildered love with lack of causal science, or when in Sodom and Gomorrah he described the Luxor obelisk as pink nougat, the moon of bitten orange, he wrote for me, and you, and no one else. So we've you know, now travelled widely together, Claudia and I. In fact, I realised during 2020 that we couldn't travel uh, because of the lockdown, but we've been together now on every continent except Antarctica. Amazing. North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and of course Australia. Um, and uh, uh, the poem I'm about to share was written after we'd been in Rome uh, a couple of years ago on our way between Washington, D.C. and Marrakesh. Uh, so there's three continents for a start. <laughs> uh, and it speaks to the difference that her presence, her company made to my experience of visiting Rome, where I'd been many times myself before, alone or with others, It's called Being in Rome. If they document our lives at any point, that day in Rome will surely have to feature, although in fact that they don't do such things, neglectful both of being and of time. Will even we agree on what took place between Testaccio and the Arch of Constantine? Here's my take, beloved, for the record. After croissants at the Café Barberini, we set off past the ruined gate of Paul, I jested at the mass of Aurelian's wall and spoke of where the Gothic camps had been, but led you on across the Aventine. How much did I relate of that hill's tale, conscious of our evanescent parsing? I mentioned Roman mansions, I recall, and their looting on the city's fall, my mind aflame with histories that I knew. But what do all such histories mean to you? Beyond that one of seven fabled hills, we came as we had purposed to the baths, and there, as I had hoped, your awe awoke. For there the soaring arches that remain, the hints and hollowed haunts of ancient marbles, sighed Rome to you with all that that implies. I've written of the baths of Caracalla, and been immersed in their imagined glories. I've dreamed for years of concerts in their gardens, of Shelley's sojourn there, and other stories. But your gratitude and shining chestnut hair have quite transformed my sense of being there. Mm. I love the, the term you used in the poem just before last, about autopoesis, a sense of um, generating an autobiography through poems about one's own life to understand you, know, you and your history, but also the life you've shared with Claudia. But you did think for a few years that you would not survive to grow old with Claudia, and that your poetry 
uh, about her was your swan song in many ways. So how does that find expression, especially towards the end of this book? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, um, but to put it in context, I, I should remark to your readers that as it happens, within a few months of Clatter arriving in Australia, I was diagnosed with melanoma. And uh, I was only finally cleared of it in March 2018. And by that stage, she'd been back in Venezuela for 11 years. So our whole relationship developed in the context of my having melanoma. And, and I was uh, in and out of hospital for years. I had many operations. I had anti-cancer drugs. Uh, and uh, so that was another thing that shaped my perception of what was possible here and uh, what its meaning was. Uh, However, of course, I survived. And by the time I wrote most of these poems, uh, the cancer was done. I'd won that battle. Um, What I wasn't sure of is, well, I I felt low on energy and I wasn't sure that I would live terribly much longer. And so the concluding poems in Lyrical Epigrams are uh, intended to convey the sense that the book has now been written. It, hopefully, will long outlast me, but... Uh, that might happen relatively soon. I might only last another 5, 10, mm-hmm. 15 years. But hopefully she and others who read the book uh, will have it long after that. And the the poem that, or one of the poems that encapsulates that sense is called uh, This Book is Chauvet Cave. And Chauvet Cave is a, is a remarkable archaeological site in France where uh, it was discovered only in the 1990s that there were cave paintings that went back 32,000 years and uh, which had been immured in that cave, buried um, due to a Paleolithic rock fall 30,000 years ago, but wonderfully preserved. And the Ice Age paintings of of beasts, many of them now extinct. Sabre-toothed tigers. Yes, and and, uh, and creatures that have long since ceased to exist in in Europe as such. Mm. Um, and uh, alongside them this was the single most remarkable thing it completely lit me up when I read about Chauvet Cave years ago they found the footprints of a young boy who had walked through the cave carrying a torch such as the wonders of archaeology they could reconstruct these remarkable facts after 32,000 years or more precisely 31,000 years because they date these things to a thousand years after the paintings had been done right And he had with him a wolfhound because the the hound's paws were there. The fact that these would be preserved, the fact that they could be reconstructed and dated is itself extraordinary. But for me, it immediately became a metaphor of the role of a reader Mm. reading a book. Mm -hmm. And the the torch that's used there is the light of understanding. Mm. You know, as one gazes at the paintings, in the case of the boy, reads the meanings of poems in the case of the reader of my book Mm. and so the poem gives expression to this and there's so many layers to that as well i mean the boy himself coming into the cave looking on artwork done a millennia with his wolfhound in tow and then here we are thirty-two thousand years on imagining the boy yes looking at the artwork yes yes so it's a it's a very luminous image an altogether extraordinary thing to have recovered Mm. and one could discuss at some length what that tells us about us, that we are able to reconstruct that past in a way that would be literally unimaginable to the boy himself or the Mm -hmm. painters of those cave paintings 32,000 years ago. It's altogether extraordinary. And and in that alone, you have a sense of what it means to be human and of what we mean by progress and civilization and technology. I mean, it's it's really Mm -hmm. an amazing story. And so I I play off that in, in the poem. Which, which goes as follows. Did you know that well within our years they found the hidden galleries of Chauvet, a cavern, love, that Stonefall sealed abruptly 27,000 years ago, immuring so its ancient mural wonders? Chauvet Cave are words to conjure with, or are, once one has come to contemplate, the artistry with which some Ice Age hunters, just five millennia before the fateful fall, depicted the great creatures of their time the subtlety and deftness of their art, recaptured from so many years ago, must prompt the realisation on our part that these painters, seen in time's long flow, were kin and not remote in kind of mind. 
that they could apprehend and then depict the moving forms of hulking Ice Age bears, the animated shapes of fighting rhinos, the eyes and mouths of horses, lion's heads, makes for startled time-lapse recognition. Imprinted on the Aurignacian floor at Chauvet Cave were found the stunning trace of one boy's footprints, partnered by a hound, who passed that way, a flickering torch in hand, with wonder etched on his illiterate face. Imagine now you are that vanished child. My book of verse, the opened Chauvet Cave. What is your torch but wit, or what your wild imaginings at all I hear engrave? And what will be the footprints that you leave? Yeah, wonderful poem, Paul. Thank you. I just would note, um, in the poem it cites 27,000 years, and I think in the conversation you said 31,000 since it was uh, interred in a way with, with the rock collapse. What, what's the discrepancy there? Yes, no, you're absolutely right, and and that occurred to me as I read the poem. Um, it was 27,000 years. In other words, there were 5,000 years, 1,000 mm. years between the painting and the, um, boy the boy seeing it, and it was 1,000 years after he saw it, if my memory now serves me correctly, that a rock slide sealed the cave. Right. Right, that's where the mistake came in. And uh, when I first did this reading and, and I wrote this up, one of the things that struck me was that 5,000 years, so they're painted 32,000 years ago, and then he sees them 27,000 years ago. So in both cases, we would say, well, you know, that's a really long time ago. They sort of bunched together. But 5,000 years, that's the equivalent of the whole of recorded history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So writing is invented 5,000 years ago. Everything that's written in terms of stories, tablets, you know, or things on stone, things on paper, it's all been recorded in the last 5,000 years. And 5,000 years took place mm. between those paintings at Chauvet and that boy seeing them. Mm. And probably, presumably, very little happened in terms of you know, the evolution of um, human civilization in that time too, which is 5,000 years of much of the very same. And then, as you know, within recorded time, 5,000 years... You know, civilization has sort of shot up and done remarkably innovative and huge forward leaps of progress. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, what springs to mind whenever we contemplate human evolution or what we call the Paleolithic uh, is that after the Ice Age, which, you know, the last glacial maximum is about 15,000 years ago, our ancestors emerged from that kind of environment. And since then, there's been this exponential increase mm. in our technological innovation, our mastery of the biosphere, and, and of course the explosion in our numbers. And that's what we refer to as history. You know, Sometimes people say, well, our history really should be dated from the time we invented writing because there's no records prior to that of what people thought. We don't know what they thought. Mm. Right? We don't know what this boy thought when he was looking at these paintings. We can only guess. Well, one thing's about you know whether he was gazing upon artworks where, which were contemporary to his society, therefore familiar, or whether it was like 5,000 years, you know, looking at a different civilization. I mean, imagine if we had um, had that sense of opening a, a cave from 5,000 years ago and it was a completely you know, different Mycenaean sort of Greek society we were gazing upon, which we'd only seen for the first time. That well, indeed. resonance, but also distance and alienness to the different cultures you're looking at. And yes, yes. I mean, there's no question that... that uh, there would be far less difference between the culture of the painters and his time over 5,000 years than between our culture and that of 5,000 years ago anywhere in the world mm. because an immense amount of change has taken place in that 5,000 years, the second 5,000 years. If we went back 5,000 years, for example, in Egypt, we're the first dynasty, right? Nama has just unified Upper and Lower Egypt. And uh, that's at the dawn of what we generally think of as history, right? Whereas when our boy walks through Chauvet Cave, it's conceivable that he was from a different tribe or people, entirely conceivable, 5,000 years is a long mm. time. But it's just as conceivable, and we can say this particularly as Australians, knowing of the very long habitation of this continent by mm. Aboriginal Australians, that his folk had been there for all those 5,000 years. Mm. But what's striking is it's only the footprints of that one boy that we have in a cave. There, there aren't footprints of other people. There's no signs of gatherings there, of comings and goings, of the painters themselves. There's the paintings without footprints. There's no other footprints that are still there, at least. But there's his. Just the one instance. It's haunting. It's mm. quite extraordinary. And so it's it's conceivable that uh, actually that cave had long since ceased to be inhabited by human beings, that his people lived somewhere nearby, but that he just wandered into that cave by chance. 
mm. and stumbled upon this into Mausoleum. This art gallery. Yeah, yeah. beautiful yeah. stuff. Yeah. So to come back to Center Frame, uh, Claudia is not the only muse you've had since you recovered from cancer, is she? There have been at least two others that we've spoken about. Would you like to tell um, us and our listeners about them today and the poetry that they inspired? Yes. Uh, I won't say a great deal about them as individuals for reasons that will become apparent in the poems, but um, they have been instances certainly of the theme that we're exploring in this particular interview, which is how do you address a person in a poem? So whereas uh, my poems for Claudia are directed to a partner whom I've known for years, who I'm very close to, with whom I've travelled very widely, um, who we, sh- you know, we share so many interests, we read things together, we share songs. That's not true with these other two individuals, and for very different reasons. One, in the first instance, is a person who um, I've never met, who uh, got in touch online and catfished me. So most of you readers perhaps these days will know what a catfish is, but essentially it's somebody who creates a fake identity online and uses it to try and fool targeted people, either for fake romance uh, or to entrap them, to bully them, to defraud them. There's all sorts of things that go on, and there's a lot of this going on. And once I realized that whoever this was, they were playing some kind of game, I had to choose do I simply cut them off and say, I'm not playing that game? Or do I explore how the game is played and make sure I win the game? And I decided that whoever this was seemed sufficiently interesting that I would play the game, but I'd play to win. Uh, And I did. And the poem that I'll share, it's one of 17 that I wrote for this person, a, a woman, I should add, and whose identity I eventually discovered. But that's... Uh, that's the coda to uh, an account of all this I've written up in book form, which I will be published soon. But along the way, I wrote the poems, and and the poems were again and again addressed to the question of who are you? Why are you playing this game? Now, it so happens that the name that she had used, uh, the identity that was being projected at me, was Rachel. And this was in 2019, and in November of that year, I was really pondering, so who is this Rachel? Is she real? Is it even a woman? Is it a different woman? Is it a group of people? Is it a male? Is it a foreign intelligence agency? I decided, because her name was Rachel, or she was using the name Rachel, to watch Blade Runner again. So the original Blade Runner, which had been released in 1982, starring Harrison Ford, uh, includes, notably, a character called Rachel, a, a woman who is in fact a replicant, that is to say a cyborg, not a real human being. And very early on, Harrison Ford, who plays the Blade Runner, the, the replicant hunter, Deckard, is asked to put her through what's called a Voigtkampf test to try and establish to his own satisfaction, is she real or is she a replicant? And uh, so I watched Blade Runner again and I was astonished to discover when I put it on that Blade Runner is in fact set in Los Angeles in November 2019. And it was November 2019, by complete coincidence, (laughs) when I put the film on. And that in itself um, prompted a couple of poems and where I took the role of Descartes. But prior to that, I I wrote a poem which addresses a you, and the you in this instance, as you'll see with the poem, is not Rachel. Uh, It's in a sense, almost me talking to myself, but it could be any reader who um, picks the poem up. Um, And so it's another variation on the theme that William Waters raises as to who is the you that's addressed in a poem. Uh, And it goes like this. What do you do when a hot woman sends you roses, sends you flirtatious messages, saying she's a continent away, but wants your attention, loves your writing? I mean, what would you do? What do you do when this firm afar seems to work in the intelligence world, travels to the Gulf, does deals in rare earths, says some Iranian bureaucrat in awe called her a Straussian woman? That's Straussian as in Richard Strauss, but she says she's a Wagner chick who likes fucking to the sounds of Beirut. Funny both composers were called Dick. But sing me what you'd do in such a case. Having tantalised me with such tags and texted that my voice was quite delish, she then played hard to get. She hinted that she's all but unattainable, but texted saucily, I want a poem. Whimsically, I dash one off for her. Would you have done as much on scant acquaintance? But even then, she still played cat and mouse. 
evading even basic conversations, though saying that my poem made her wet. At last I thought, this woman is a catfish. She is not the person she purports to be. She is playing games of some clandestine kind, which don't bode well, as far as I can see. Would you play games like this, both dumb and blind? Yeah, so it's clear that that poem is not addressing Rachel, but... Mm. I mean, perhaps yourself in some sort of reflective tone or uh, address you're making to yourself. Uh, perhaps other people, you're looking around the room for, for counsel and instruction. Mm. Um, it's a quite fluid you, isn't it, in yeah. that sense, right? And so often it, is. It's a nice illustration of what Waters is driving at when he says, you know, uh, who is the you that's addressed in a poem? Mm. Uh, and the answer is that quite frequently, and certainly in that case, it's a multiform chameleon like you. It's a mm. variable you. Right and um, uh, and and I don't think anybody would read that and think that that's Rachel because plainly I'm talking to some you about Rachel, mm. not addressing Rachel, mm. but who the you is, of course, uh, is you know. But we do have yeah. conversations with ourselves at times, right, as if we're two people. Mm. What are you doing, for instance? You know, when yeah, you yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. Pull yourself is, together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, mm. right. So, so that's that's partly what's clearly going on in this poem. Um, but because of its construction, any given reader could feel addressed by it, and and they're being asked. So, what would you do? Mm. You know, um, uh, and and that was fun. And the um, uh, I, I'm you know look. Given that explanation, it might be worth sharing one of the Descartes poems because their Descartes is addressing his Rachel. Um, and I wrote this address to, as it were, my Rachel in order to put her in that frame of reference and ask, so are you any more real than the replicant Rachel? In Blade Runner. In Blade yeah. Runner, right? Uh, and if those who know the story of Blade Runner will relate to the details in the poem, but I hope that it's otherwise intelligible anyway, just as a little drama. Mm-hmm. Rick Deckard shot down Zora Salome, a stunning replicant on the lamb, fugitive humanoid without a home, one of the off-world Nexus rebels reaching to Earth for life and meaning, hurling her through shattering glass. Leon nearly had said Deckard cold, hard fingers set to shove his eyeballs into his dutiful Blade Runner brain, but tearful Rachel in her glossy mink retired the vengeful Leon from behind using Deckard's flung and disregarded gun. All this was in the darkling film noir streets of Philip Dick's dystopia in L.A., where hovercraft and vast electric signs, huge pyramids of opaque glass and steel, conjured out of strange Egyptian means by Ridley Scott, set troubling puzzles. The acts in question, filmed in 82, took place within the month we're in right now, and so I dwell on Jorah's crystal night. Then the death of Leon, Pris and Roy, but chiefly now I dwell on dark-eyed Rachel, whose vital shot made Deckard her protector, he triggered that with their prolonged exchange concerning Voigt-Kampf questions of those eyes. Not twenty, not just thirty, all cross-reference, but a hundred probing who and what she was. She'd eyeballed Deckard, studied and composed, then fled to him as Zora fled to Earth. So uh, that's, uh, of course, um, communicated to Rachel. Right, I sent her that poem, and she, she responded in, in, instead of with the question, who are you addressing this poem? What makes you liken me to a replicant? Mm. Instead, she texted me saying, I went straight home from a party I was at when I heard your voice reciting that poem on my voicemail. Right. And I put on Blade Runner and watched it again with your stunning words revolving in my mind. Mm. So there's a person who's been addressed by the poem uh, and yet not in a straightforward way, mm. right? Because the poem itself is the narrative you know, of what goes on in the movie. And yet there's a resonance that she uh, intuits and feels. And Yes. Mm. And so the question in my mind was, what an interesting response when she's not owning that she's, so to speak, a replicant, that, yeah. that she's a fake identity. Yes. She's, she's not even explaining why exactly she found the poem stunning. And if what she's saying is that she found it stunning simply as a reader of the poem and that it had nothing to do with her or her and me, then it's also really rather remarkable, um, you know, you yeah. might say a, a, a very cool response. And it intrigued me. And and it was because Rachel was intriguing that I kept playing the game. Mm. But I kept sending it... In a playful a, way, not a genuinely romantic way, as you're addressing Klaus, for instance. In oh, no, no, it's yeah. completely different. It, it was 
not romantic in anything like the sense of my communication with Claudia, who was so real and, and we had such a relationship, which was developing and deepening. No. On the other hand, Rachel was an intriguing figure. I'd never been catfished before. I'd never had somebody ask me to write a romantic poems who was plainly intelligent but wouldn't talk on the phone, who wouldn't for many months give me an email address, who refused to meet but would talk about the idea of a clandestine meeting, a secret yeah. meeting, a possible meeting, um, and whose projected image at least, and this turned out, I found in the end, to be accurate, was of a, of a, a, an attractive woman, no, no question, you know, sexually attractive and, and clearly intelligent, but, but somewhat troubled and manipulative. And... Um, uh, so, you know, I wouldn't call it romantic, but it was erotic. It was it was fascinating and it was an engaging game. And the game for me was to thwart any agenda she had to fool me or mislead me or beguile me or bully me or anything else, but to winkle out, why is she doing this and who is she really? And in the end, I did. Mm. Uh, and she spat the dummy <laughs> and, and I wrote a book. Yeah. So that's quite a story in itself, but... And the other major muse you've experienced is of a more recent nature, but does not involve any catfishing. No, no catfishing at all in the third case. And uh, uh, some real acquaintance, but but very little so far. Um, and this is a case, you know, of a kind that and many people will relate to this. This is um, a woman that I met in the last couple of years and immediately found very appealing, very striking, very impressive in all the ways that, if I may say so, uh, you know, a mature and intelligent man would. I mean, she's she's beautiful, she's intelligent, she's gracious, she's very competent at what she does. She works in a field uh, close to many of my interests. Um, we've met, we've spoken, you know. Um, so there's a reality to this that was simply never present in the, you know, the goings on with Rachel. Um, and then what I discovered is that I had feelings for her that, I was very hesitant to express to her because I thought, whoa, this has just overtaken me and I'm not sure what to make of it and I'm not at all sure how she'd respond. So uh, what I did in these cases, and this is where it plays into the theme we're discussing from William Waters about who does a poem address, uh, is how how do I think this through? And I, I wrote a quite long poem, which I'll share in a moment, called Secret Poem, which as the listeners will see begins and ends with the statement, I've got to keep this poem a secret because if I don't, if, if I send it to her, it could land like a bomb, <laughs> mm. you know, not because it's offensive, but because it would come as a big surprise. And, and overwhelmingly uh, you know, intense and erratic. And, yeah. Yes, all those things, right. And um, uh, But nevertheless, it, it's an attempt to, to express the nuances of what, I'm going through and how I feel about her and how I'm thinking about that. Um, and since it's not sent, then the question becomes, well, who is the you that's actually being addressed here as distinct from being talked about, right? Uh, so it goes as follows. This first poem for you must be a secret, since if I share it with you fecklessly, I fear that I would simply spook the horses when following our first real conversation, I'd prefer to play the canny horse whisperer. You called, you called, you spoke to me, declaring how fantastic it had been that I had accepted your official invitation eighteen months before to the I War Forum. I War Forum, but this is love. Is all then fair in love and war? Ah, what does fairness have to do with those old games? All of life's most ancient strategies were bundled into how you spoke to me. Oh, how since then my heart has been on fire. You must have sensed from what I'd sent to you how ardently, if mordantly, I'd burned before your cool and quiet voice heaped every kind of fuel upon the fire, but still consumed my psychic energy. Now, when I walk, I breathe in your warmth, like oxygen itself, to feed the flames, exhaling step by step the doubts and fears that must attend an unexpected fall into longings, raptures, wonders I thought done. You've enchanted me, as hasn't happened in more years now than I prefer to count. How so? Ah, in truth, since you embody everything that I have ever loved of beauty, charm, intelligence, and grace. Yet even when I sent my lines of worship, you responded, after giving them some thought, in such a measured way as to encourage leaping hopes of future intimacy, 
that now have me afraid of writing more. Ah, oh, lovely one, if we were in a play, I'd court your company with clever rhymes. I'd sing some song like Cohen's Hallelujah, and speak to you of living on the edge. But this, as we both know, is no mere play. This is now the forum we both spoke in, on Iwar, in the roiling outer world, in which the schemes of charlatans and powers lay traps for the unwary to undo them, transferred to our inner shadow worlds. Such Iwars wreck the inscape of the psyche, which fractures into memories, hopes, and fears, where each of us, as I, will apprehend the black-clad knights of ghost wars from our past, and so raise up suspicions and defences. Your eyes, your smile, the gracious way you move, the gentle, candid tenor of your voice, the fact alone that you reached out to me, and spoke of progress in your PhD, should set at ease my veteran, weary heart. Instead, I find I am pondering the art of how one draws such beauty to oneself, caresses it and whispers to its wildness to win its ease. That's why I murmur, this first poem for you must be a secret. So, thinking back to William Waters, who is really being addressed here? Yes. Uh, uh, before I answer that question, I probably should explain that, you know, I had said earlier that I wouldn't send a poem because it might, well, as the poem itself says, spook the horses, and yet I mentioned in a poem that I'd sent lines of worship. So it's probably worth explaining that in the book I described earlier about Rachel, I refer, because it's a true story, to being at the Iwall Forum in October 2019. Uh, and the woman that I'm addressing in this new poem was the one who invited me to that conference. And so one of the answers to your question is the poem addresses her. But we'll come back to that. But what are these lines of what I called worship? Well, in telling the story about meeting her at the conference, I say that she was beautiful, intelligent, gracious. You know, I was smitten. Um, and uh, I play with that a little facetiously in the draft book about Rachel, where I say at one point that I entertained this sort of fantasy that perhaps the mysterious Rachel, or whoever it was, was actually this other person. And that this was a... This was an intelligence training exercise, and I'd been made a target. And I thought, you know, there's a part of me that really wants that to be true. <laughs> mm. But then I commented, that look, it's, it's not. It, it's highly implausible. Um, and I, I sent those passages to her to review, saying that I hoped they wouldn't make her feel uncomfortable. I'd like to think she would find them entertaining. And it was after reading them, that she called me and we had a perfectly sensible, very pleasant conversation about it all. So that's what's being alluded mm. to in the poem. But the irony of it was that that conversation so enhanced my admiration for her that then I thought, I'm not what, sure what to say next because I fear putting a foot wrong here. I fear mm. <laughs> getting this wrong or coming on too strong. So to revert to your question about who is being addressed, clearly at the superficial level at least, she is being addressed. But she's being addressed in secret, and she doesn't know she's being addressed. And that, of course, raises the, what you might call the waters question. Mm. So if she's implicitly being addressed, but she doesn't know she's being addressed, then in a sense she's not being addressed. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's the magic of poetry, mm -hmm. right? Um, that we, we create, this poem creates, an imagined conversation with a projected idea of the you. And it's trying to construct um, a, uh, a thought experiment as to how would you react if I actually told you these things. Mm. These things which I'm confessing but which you're not reading because I hesitate to send them to you. Mm. Right? And Waters does a lot of that analysis in his book. He does it beautifully. And, and one of the best examples is a reflection on a poem by Rainer Maria Rilke um, called Lullaby. And um, I'd say as much as any of the poems that he analyzes in his book, it's his analysis of Rilke's lullaby that really got me thinking about precisely what's at issue in this poem. You know, that he says with a lullaby, for example, where it says that the paradox of a lullaby is that it's something addressed to, say, a child, but in the expectation that the child will fall asleep listening and so actually won't hear out the poem, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so there's an overlap between that and what happens in this poem where one's ardently addressing yes. a person you know who one finds very attractive 
but hesitates precisely because of the intensity of that attraction to directly address them at all. Mm. Right? Just in the veil of secrecy. And yes, yes. Unuttered. And yeah. yet it's not a deceit, right? It, it's, a, it's an honest and heartfelt effort to think through an imaginary dialogue or think through rather the paradox that you want the dialogue and yet the dialogue seems inadvisable at this stage. Mm. So I suppose thinking about all that, where, where does this lead? Because you, uh, the la last line of the poem is, you know, this first poem, poem for you must be a secret. Potentially there might be subsequent poems which might be um, out of the veil of secrecy. Yes, well, I'd like to think so. I mean, I guess this happens at an early point in, in any um, romance, whether or not the romance becomes a mutual romance, you know, a relationship of some kind or other. And I'm at the point in this instance, very, very early, where I've got to figure out, you know, okay, I'm dazzled, but who is this person really? And how receptive would they be to anything I might write? Because I really, as that poem says, I don't want to spook the horses. I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable or harassed in any way. I, um, but there have already been more poems, uh, equally, in a sense, as secret as that first one, because none of them have been sent to her. Um, and depending on things, how things go, they might never be sent because I don't, you know, I'm not going to, as it were, push them or myself at her. I'm going to mm. be very sensitive about this for all sorts of reasons. Uh, however, there's a, a beautiful piece of music, a, a two-minute little composition by the French composer, early 20th century French composer, Eric Satie, um, called Nocien Three. It was one of a set of these poems called Nocien, plural which he composed, um, and he invented the term Nocien. You know, when I read it, I think of Gnosis and Gnosticism mm. and so on. I think one's mm. probably supposed to, but it's not itself a dictionary word. He, he sort of made it up. Um, and as I was listening to that composition, and I listened to it again and again, the mood of it, the, the way it's constructed, seemed to me singularly opposite the circumstances to the mood I was in, in trying to think through these, these passionate feelings that couldn't readily find a comfortable outlet except in secret poetry. And so I wrote a much shorter poem than the secret poem called Nocien Three, which just uh, reflects on that. But it reflects on the fact that whereas I haven't sent this woman the poems, I did send her a clip of that music uh, of it being played mm. uh, without comment, just that, you know, in an SMS. And of course I've been wondering since so what did she think about that? Did she like the music? What did it tell her about what I might be thinking? What what did she start to think about what I was trying to communicate by sending it at all and sending it in particular? Right. So so this poem uh, goes as follows in rhyming couplets: Why did I text you, Nocian three, to listen to at night and think of me? Answer with a kiss when we should meet. Such music would roll back my long defeat. Its melancholy, meditative tone expresses my dream of you when I'm alone. The liminal sati, desolé, neglected, captured like a bird, recorded, resurrected. A prolepsis of the mystery that your eyes should only now, but only now, arise, so Hesperidian at the sunset of my being, with memories folding inward, futures fleeing. So the, you know... What's implicit, I suppose, in that, even to somebody who doesn't know me or know her, is that she's substantially younger than me, that I'm not a young man, that my life is in a lot of ways set, um, and that I think it's probably implausible that an intimate relationship will arise between us. I'm conscious of that. Um, nevertheless, I'm struck by her beauty as a person and wonderstruck really and so I'm reflecting on that and the mood of the music is somewhat melancholy because uh, the mood that led me to listen to it to send to it and to write the poem is that you know wow it, you can entertain the fantasy as it were the idea of intimacy with this beautiful person the probability is that that's not going to happen though there may be perfectly civilised contact and communication there already has been um and so it it's um it's addressed again to a you without any doubt but it's not itself sent to that you it's a reflection on the 
implicit but very private sense of dialogue with another person who's actually not there. Mm. Um, and yeah. so we, we started this conversation by reflecting on communicative intimacy and the idea of uh, authentic understanding between different people who are in a romantic or platonic or any other kind of relationship. And so I wonder whether the poet can know, you in this specific instance, with any confidence, you know, whether this third muse thinks anything of your love or perhaps uh, whether, you know, if your poetry never directly addressed her, she might intuit it in some way in the same sense that, you know, someone might intuit, you know, um, uh, Picasso being inspired by them and painting beautiful pa paintings, which, you know, are not directly addressed to them or representative of them, but, um, you know, address them in a more roundabout kind of way. Yes, it, it does raise interesting questions. I mean, um, since you ask, it, it takes me back to an experience many, many years ago when I was still a young man and I met a young woman. Uh, she was an instructor at a gym I used to work out at. And uh, she was just delightful. She was beautiful. She was very pleasant. You know, she was sweet natured. And uh, I used to hang out, just go and do an, an aerobics class with her as instructor, you know. Um, what I discovered is that she was engaged to be married to a guy, you know, of her own age. They were younger than me. Um, but I couldn't altogether contain my feelings, and I wrote a couple of poems. Uh, and they were love poems addressed to her. And uh, without signing them, I left them for her at the gym on Valentine's Day that year with a rose. <laughs> and then a really, a really kind of charming thing occurred you know she and I were were sitting on on exercise bikes one day just cycling and chatting away and I was just chatting as if it was the most normal thing in the world which in of course in a sense it was and she started to say to me that that she'd had these mysterious love poems sent to her and she was still trying to figure out mm. who had written them <laughs> <laughs> and so finally since she seemed relaxed in my presence I said look I've got to confess it was me oh she said I, I didn't think it would be you because you seem so relaxed. We just talk normally. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I've never forgotten this. And, and um, her boyfriend then approached me, not that day, but, you know, soon afterwards. And he said in a, in a calm, pleasant sort of way, he said, look, she and I are going to get married. And, and you know, I, I, I know why you find her attractive because I do. And we we both love the poems. He said, we've got them sitting at home on the, on the hi-fi, you know, like Christmas cards. Hmm. But we're going to get married. I said, I understand. I understand. I mean, you know, that's that's a given. I just wanted to express my feelings, you know. So that was a quite charming incident, right? Now, um, I would like to think that at a minimum, something like that might occur in the present case if or when the woman to whom these poems are implicitly addressed ever gets to hear about them or listen to them or read them. But I also think that this is a different set of circumstances. Um, I'm much older than I was there, much more experienced. Um, we have shared professional interests, which was certainly not the case really with the gym instructor all those years ago. Uh, and so I'd rather like to think that, that there will be further communication and I'll just work out my feelings as I go in a civilized way, you know, and, um, but that because that happens, there will come a time where, where she can listen to these and, and not feel in any way uncomfortable about them and, in fact, be deeply appreciative that they were written. And, and I have some warrant for believing that because she's already written the lines that I drafted in my book and, and responded very warmly, really. So, so uh, you know, I, I don't think that there's a grave problem here, I, I, but I'm just trying to be sensible in the way I approach it and um, and that's why to round things out I suppose the question of the addressable you and addressable reality you know that I referred to in the opening paragraph of my book lyrical epigrams is so opposite it's mm. why this is a really interesting experience of that for me as a poet as well as as a human being well, thank you very much for your time today, Paul. It's been a pleasure speaking once again. Yes, yes, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun sharing the poems, and I hope the the, the listeners uh, find them moving in their different ways. <laughs>